welcome to another edition of the UK Law Weekly Podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week, we're going to be looking at the case of Perry and Rayleigh's solicitors, and the citation for this case is 2019 UKSC 5. And to put it plainly, if you love tort law, then this is certainly the case for you. It has its origins back in the days when there were still a lot of active mines in the UK, although the respondent in this case, Mr Perry, has now retired. Unfortunately, before he even stopped working in the mine, he began suffering from a medical condition called hand-arm vibration syndrome, or HAVS as it is commonly known. Given that name, you will not be surprised to learn that HAVS can be caused by excessive exposure to hand or arm vibrations, something that was par for the course in the mining industry where heavy machinery was used on an almost daily basis. The actual effect on Perry is very similar to what you would experience if your own hands were exposed to the cold for a significant amount of time. In other words, his fingers become numb and turn white due to poor circulation. In more severe cases, the nerves and muscles can be affected, leading to a loss of dexterity and the ability to perform fairly simple manual tasks. After a number of prolonged legal battles between the unions and the government throughout the 1990s, it was eventually established that the National Coal Board had been negligent in its failure to take reasonable steps to prevent exposure to HABs amongst its workers. As a result, a compensation scheme was set up with awards being based on the severity of the condition affecting each miner. Under the scheme, there were essentially two types of compensation payment for general and special damages. And for those of you who are perhaps less familiar with tort law, General damages covers non-economic stuff, such as the actual pain caused, while special damages covers economic loss by a claimant. For a person to qualify for general damages, there was a medical interview and examination, followed by an assessment of how bad the individual's pain and suffering was deemed to be. Compensation was then paid out on this basis, although deductions could be made when there were other medical conditions that contributed to the applicant's physical injury. Special damages could potentially be wide-ranging, but for our purposes, we will focus on an agreement from the year 2000, which looked at the ability to carry out six basic domestic tasks, namely gardening, window cleaning, DIY, decorating, car washing and car maintenance. If the applicant could show that they were previously able to carry out one or more of these tasks, but could no longer do so, and required assistance in this regard, then they could make a successful claim for special damages. Coming back to Mr Perry, he began his claim back in 1996, and the medical assessment showed his pain and suffering to be so bad that not only did he qualify for general damages, but there was also a rebuttable presumption that he also qualified for the special damages we just mentioned. This should have been excellent news, but Perry's legal representation from the appellant Rayleigh's solicitors settled the case in 1999 for the payment of general damages only, without any claim whatsoever for special damages under the scheme. It was only a decade later in 2009 that a professional negligence claim was brought by Mr Perry against the solicitors for more than £17,000, at this point, long-time subscribers will be sick of me saying this, but for the sake of new subscribers, and also perhaps as a reminder for some, in order to establish negligence, there has to be a duty of care, and there has to be a breach of that duty of care, which causes injury or loss to the claimant, without it being too remote. In this case, the actual duty of care is simple to identify because of the lawyer-client relationship. Furthermore, Rayleigh's themselves admitted that they had breached the duty of care, but denied that this had caused the loss to Mr Perry in question. It was also suggested that after a decade, such a claim should be time-barred. When the case went to the county court, the time limitation defence was rejected, but the judge agreed that there was no causal link between the breach of duty and any loss suffered by Mr Perry. On the surface, this might seem very strange, Rayleigh's have done something wrong, and there is nobody else seemingly at fault for the loss caused. Well, the judge brought the question back round to those six tasks that we mentioned earlier, as being associated with a claim for special damages. The car cleaning, washing windows, etc. He found that Mr Perry had not actually proved that he could not perform any of the tasks mentioned, 
and so he would not have been able to make a good claim for special damages anyway. When the case went up to the Court of Appeal, it was held that causation had in fact been established, and so the decision was reversed. Rayleigh's obviously wanted that original finding of the county court judge to be restored, and so now they appealed to the Supreme Court, which is where we pick things up. The justices viewed this in the context of loss of chance damages. In other words, because Mr Perry arguably lost out on the chance to claim from the compensation scheme during the 1990s because of Rayleigh's solicitors, he should now be able to make a claim from them in 2019. This can be difficult because it involves a significant degree of speculation about what could have happened, and so the usual standard of proving something on the balance of probabilities will not be adhered to strictly. Nevertheless, that is not the same thing as saying that there is no evidential burden on the claimant whatsoever, and the correct approach is outlined in the case of Allied Maples Group Limited and Simmons and Simmons from 1995. Here it was stated that the claimant must prove what they would have done at the time on the balance of probabilities, while the actions of others is dependent on a loss of chance evaluation. Now the potential can of worms that you open up in this scenario is that you end up essentially conducting a trial within a trial, but the legal authorities do seem to try and avoid that as much as possible. There is a careful balance that has to be struck between trying to give a full and proper assessment of the evidence without relitigating the past. So how does this approach actually apply in the case before us today? Some of the questions are dependent on testimony given by Mr Perry, but a lot of information is available through the medical evidence relating to his condition, and it simply does not make sense to ignore this or not take it fully into account. The question then is whether Perry would have made a claim for special damages if he had in fact been properly advised by Rayleigh's. In the county court there was an additional requirement added that this should have been an honest claim, in the sense that it would be reasonable to bring a claim for compensation based on the facts. The Supreme Court held that this prerequisite was fair because the court should not reward dishonest claims. It is reasonable to assume that all claims are honest, and if the facts do not add up, then there would be no basis for an honest claim. When the trial judge put this evidence to the test, it was found that the burden of proof placed on Mr Perry had not been satisfied, and the Court of Appeal was wrong to jump in and overturn this determination of the facts of the case. For our own analysis of this case, it is useful to return to the most sensitive aspect. To what extent is it desirable to have a full trial 20 years after the facts of any given case occurred? On the one hand, such extensive litigation would ensure that everything has been done to try and achieve the correct result in any given case. On the other hand, this would be a time-consuming exercise for the court, and it has to be said that evidence from such a long time in the past is not only difficult to analyse, but may also tend to favour one party over the other, and might simply be wrong. How you balance this out is not easy, but the Supreme Court made a move in the right direction here by confirming a lot of what was said in Allied Maples. Medical evidence that stands up to rigorous scientific analysis should rarely be ignored. Meanwhile, the structure of the case itself, as it was tried in the county court, was correct in the sense that the burden of proof placed on the claimant should not be completely forgotten, and indeed when it comes to the actions of the claimant, ought to still be based on the balance of probabilities. Some commentators and analysts will come away from this case with the view that it is not right that the solicitor's firm has essentially got away with a breach of its duty of care, but as we discussed, this alone is not enough to establish a successful claim in tort, which is based on compensating a person for a loss that they have actually suffered. Mr Perry was compensated at the time for his loss, and any claim for special damages, whether honest or dishonest, would likely have failed based on the simple fact that he could not show any need for assistance in performing the six tasks discussed. It is questionable why his own legal representation took this case on without the evidence to demonstrate this on the balance of probabilities. Finally, a word should be said about the Court of Appeal as well. Already in 2019, there have been a couple of instances where the Supreme Court has had to overturn decisions of the Court of Appeal because it has gone too far in interfering with the original decisions from the lower courts. Where that is on a question of law, it is justifiable, but 
In cases like this where it comes down to the finding of fact, it's much less so. That is not to say it is impossible, but the test for such an intervention is extremely stringent and simply not met in cases like this. One can see why those judges might regard the law as unfair in this area, or be sympathetic towards Mr Perry, but that in itself is no excuse for undermining some of the key principles of tort law. The concern is that when justices of the Supreme Court retire, it tends to be those from the Court of Appeal who are promoted to fill those roles. The current crop are not exactly showering themselves in glory, and that will soon become problematic when it is they that get the final word on the law. Well, thank you very much for tuning into this podcast episode, and thanks as ever to bensound.com who provide the theme music. I'll be back with another case to discuss next week, but for now, bye!